Well, I want to welcome y'all to our uh, our second part of our Epiphany Tide series on the work of Christmas, uh, going through Howard Thurman's um, poem on the work of Christmas and his song in that. And this evening uh, we have with us as our special guest, uh, the Reverend Bob Flick. And so join me in welcoming Bob. Welcome. Welcome, Thanks. Bob. Bob. Okay. I'm and sure so I've just seen as some a, of you, some remind, of you in church. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Just as a reminder, uh, here, uh, which you can't really read, uh, but we're going to go with it, is the poem. Um, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, and to make music in the heart. Amen. Amen. So Bob is going to share with us some on To Find the Lost. So we're doing To Find the Lost, yes. So um, I wanted to, and I, I hope that this can be um, a discussion that, you know, folks, uh, feel free to interject whatever is yours and I will kind of lead from some notes that I have um, and the background I guess that I come out of which I suspect is probably the reason I was invited to do this in the first place. So well, that and your amazingness but yeah. I don't, I don't know if y'all know but um, I've been uh, I'm a friend of obviously of, of uh, Meredith and of, uh, of Nick for probably a long time I probably uh, years, I, I would say. Uh, and uh, I, I currently am the interim uh, rector at Good Shepherd and Friendswood. And I, uh, I, I just have been doing sort of interim things since I officially retired. I officially retired about five years ago from uh, maybe four years, five years, I guess, been since from uh, Lord of the Streets, where I was the vicar for uh, some years. I, uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but that's a congregation of the diocese uh, that is located in Midtown, um, just south of, of the downtown area. That is in fact a congregation of uh, homeless men and women. So I've been ordained 40 years. Um, that's a long time, <laughs> I'm really old. Uh, and uh, most of my um, uh, experience as a minister priest type has been with um, people who are home, foreign missions, um, and then domestic, what we might call domestic missions, people uh, uh, working among the homeless. Um, I have a degree in psychotherapy like, uh, like Mickey does, and uh, and I haven't done that for a while, but for about 13 years of my time as a priest, I ran all the outpatient uh, mental health uh, clinics in Galveston County and Brazoria County for the state of Texas. Uh, they, they basically serve the needs of people with severe and persistent mental illnesses, uh, mostly psychotic types of disorders like, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, stuff like that. Um, so I did that professionally for a while. Uh, I've done spiritual direction for years. I was ordained a Catholic priest and I was a Franciscan for 25 years. So I think that my spirituality and, and therefore the ministerial choices that I've made through my life have pretty much been grounded in that Franciscan background. And some of that is what I want to kind of build into what what I am sort of projecting onto this poem, which is just me. So I'm 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 here to be uh, for you all to, to project as much as you want to where you what you think uh, uh, that uh, Thurman was uh, trying to say when it's a poem after all. So that's the way we do with poetry. So. Um, bear with me. Uh, I would like to start and sort of frame our discussion in the context of uh, a, a scripture 
uh, but let me put it on the screen and maybe one of you uh, can read it. It's uh, Matthew 25, and I think that for me, it's one of the most uh, important scriptures in my, um, in my spiritual kind of bag of, of prayer. And uh, if no one wants to read it, I would be happy to, but if someone would volunteer, um, if you can read through it and I'll scroll down as, as we need to the extra one. Just setting here. Try that. Would someone like to volunteer to read it? I will. Thank you very kindly. Because I'm the oldest. <laughs> You're a deacon. It's a gospel reading. It's no, quite I'm not. I'm just old. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> when the Son of God comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will, then he will, it's part of it's missing, will thrown the last sent part of the sentences are missing the picture oh you can move uh your let me i can put it back to the other setting uh or you can you can move your people around too but let me put it back to the other setting make it easier maybe how's that it's all right i can read yeah when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd she separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry? and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at the left hand, you that are accused, accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thank you so much. So this uh, is obviously a quite familiar reading from the gospel of Matthew chapter 25. And um, I think it, for me, it, it, it is life-giving to be able to I hear the gospel so clearly calling me to, um, to be able to, uh, and desirous of entering into the lives of other people who are in need. I think it paints that picture of Jesus, uh, the life of Jesus. We, you know, there are so many people these days that I think we call themselves Christians and, and that, um, 
kind of uh, definition, that, that title has been sort of washed out, I think, over time, and certainly, I think, recently um, in lots of ways. And I, I don't think it's about you know, the title we give ourselves as about the way we, the, the behavior that we have. And it's not about calling myself a Christian. It's about asking myself, do I do what Jesus would do? Um, and, and I believe that that's, that's really the, the most fundamental of, of questions. And so it, I think that reading the, the poem that Meredith read to, to start us off and this kind of a scriptural invitation to basically <laughs> the way Matthew frames it to salvation, you know, <laughs> you know to, to do the right thing um, is, is fundamental to who we are. But I think it uh, it begs the, uh, uh, the a question. You know why why is it why why should we do these things? Does anybody has have you thought about that? Why? So we in, sort of instinctively know that yeah, it's nice to feed the hungry and, and you know uh, visit the imprisoned and and bury the dead and all we used to call the corporal works of mercy. I don't know if we still do. Um, at least we did in the Catholic persuasion way back. Uh, but why? What, 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 why would we do that? There's, I would think there are lots of reasons. Um, why would any of you be interested in doing what Jesus has asked us to do here? Because we love him. Because we love Christ. Jesus. So we do it out of out of love for Jesus. Well, it, you love he loves us so much. The love just overflows onto those around you. Oh my God, you are a Trinitarian. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Father, Son, Spirit, love for each other. That love is overwhelmingly flowing into the experience of of, of creation, and then all of creation, you know, being absorbed in that in that love that is beyond absorbable, right? Um, okay, so so love being one answer. Why, why else would somebody, why would anybody, why would you choose to do these kinds of things? To I think my answer might be a little more pragmatic. <laughs> um, you know, I, and that's not to dismiss that we do it out of reverence for God and um, out of love because we do. But I think there's more to it. I think that if we look at the way our brains function, we feel good when we make others feel good. And that doesn't dismiss Christ in that because I think that that's a God-given thing. But I think that as we manifest grace and as we give to others, it feels good to us. And so I think that there, we can't, be really honest and say some of why we do things for others isn't to feel good for ourselves because I think that's part of it I also think that there's so much more wrapped up in it you know like there there's the love of God wrapped up in there and there's the love of everyone else wrapped up in there but I think that if we're really really going to be honest that there is also it feels really good okay great anybody else what what's going on in you what what would motivate you to do good things in the world and to the world around you? I think for me, like maybe not exactly right now because I'm feeling rather cynical recently, but on my non-cynical days, it's because like I want things to be better. <laughs> Like, you know, I want, I want to be better. I want the world to be better and I want to be part of that. And so um, there's this like desire and maybe there's, I mean, it's not all altruistic as you're saying, but it's also like, like yeah, there's another way, come on. So there's yeah. a little bit of that in that for me. Yeah. Great. So I, the reason I asked the question is because I think what I'm wanting to hear is where are you each coming from in terms of your own spirituality? right? Uh, because, because we just read the gospel, we read this poem that, that is obviously grounded in gospel values, and we call ourselves Christians, and we desire to 
uh, we say we desire to to build up the kingdom of God or, or the yeah, and and around us and to and to make love visible in 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 us and who we are. And what we're talking about then is our own spirituality. One of the things that I do a lot of now, I don't do therapy anymore, but is spiritual direction. And so it's a it's such a blessing to be able to sit with individuals like you all who I wouldn't have signed in tonight if you didn't have some and, and Meredith used the word desire, which is key to this, that word desire, some deep desire to, uh, to come to know Jesus in your life. And I think it's important for us as individuals who want to, to follow Christ to have a sort of a sense of our own spirituality. And so what I'd like to offer you tonight a little bit of a taste of maybe is a framework, a little bit of a framework for spirituality, and I want to frame it as a journey. And part of the reason I use the word journey or the the uh, the, the template journey or the definition or whatever the noun to describe the descriptor journey uh, is because it implies that we are we are moving. And as Christians. I believe if we are followers of Jesus, if we're not moving, then we're not doing what Jesus did because we just celebrated Jesus's birthday. And by the way, he wasn't at home when he was born. And we don't have any evidence really that he ever was. You know, our scriptures certainly don't dwell on Jesus's big old mansion, you know, uh, driving his, you know, Mercedes or whatever. It's you know, he's, his life was that of a journey. Um, and ultimately, of course, a journey to and through the cross into uh, resurrection and, and new life, that, that template being created, life, death, resurrection, you know, new life. Um, so we are on a, a journey. And, and the, the journey then, I think, has to somehow have definition and uh, and part of the definition to the journey is to be able to identify what motivates us and so what i'd like to offer is my some of my franciscan background and the the way saint bonaventure talked about um the spiritual journey and it um and and i'll frame that uh very quickly because <laughs> this is like a, a life long thing for me to put together. So, uh, you know, an hour or uh, half an hour now is kind of going to be a squeeze. But so, so we talk about a journey. Uh, we talk about therefore movement. We talk about movement toward what? I mean, Jesus didn't just set out and and sort of randomly ramble all over, you know, all over Israel or wherever. You know, he he had a fixed eye on essentially on on um, the journey toward new life and the journey toward something bigger than what we experience right now. That the journey, uh, you know, to, through our own experiences into, the, uh, into a deep re relationship, abiding relationship with his father. And so it implied kind of looking for God, right? Looking for God, inviting people to find the presence of God all around them, inviting people into um, their own pain and struggle and suffering, inviting people into their own sinfulness. We look at the people that Jesus associated with, and basically that's what this poem is about, and clearly that's what the Gospel of Matthew is about, you know, people that Jesus associated with were people who were in need and struggling and suffering and called people, uh, his followers, in, into those kinds of relationships. 
And we can say, well, it's, you know, to fix the relationship, you know, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, release the prisoners. But I think in terms of our spiritual journey, we don't just go around putting band-aids on things or fixing things. We seek to find God in those things, as was sort of related earlier when people were saying, I kind of feel good when I do these things. Well, yeah, praise God, because we find God in those kinds of relationships, in the connectedness that we have, as, as, um, as the poem says, seeking after, trying to find the lost, right? That's what Jesus did, attempting to bring healing and forgiveness and uh, the, the uh, release and, and the, the kinds of things that are more profound than just stuff uh, into the lives of people who are lost. So, uh, so we, we, I would like to frame that any reflection so far, I kind of feel like I can babble on and on uh, and maybe not say much. But did, did anybody hear anything? Yes. <laughs> like what? Uh, what? Just go ahead and uh, just talk if you're unmuted. What do you think? What am I? What am? What did you hear? Mm. Well, let me just talk. Let me just talk. Sure. Okay. What were you gonna say, something, Mickey? I was just gonna say that when you're when when you talk about um, finding God in all those places, it it's like okay, I I didn't want to be in this grief, but where is God in this grief? Yeah, and I so, didn't want my house to be flooded and have all this crap going on, but where is God in all that crap? Yeah. So there are two basic ways to look at uh, spirituality that were kind of in the in the 15th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, particularly sort of um, uh, developed over time. And we talk about two particular schools: the schools of, of uh, abandonment, um, where um, some of the big saints, uh, John of the Cross, Benedict, for that matter, for the most part, uh, talk about oftentimes. Um, a spirituality of letting go, of emptying, of, uh, of, of, of seeking to and spending time on your journey, uh, um, essentially um, letting go so that God can fill you and bring new life that way. The spirituality that I'm, I guess, talking about tonight and inviting you into consideration uh, is founded really on like the Gospel of Matthew, where, where I and, and and it works for me, where we find ourselves not desiring to let go of anything, but to embrace all that there is. And so when Mickey says, you know, uh, uh, to to look at all of life, to look at the 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 difficulties, the pain, the struggle, um, it's not a matter of of walking through that. Here's what, here's a good example. All these memes on Facebook that say, well, it's so good, we can kiss 2020 goodbye and just start all new in 2021 and essentially, um, you know, try to forget as much as we can of 2020. What I'm inviting uh, people to in, in terms of, of, of a spirituality of journey is to not do just the opposite, to, to allow ourselves to be called in to what it is that we are being, um, being encouraged to change um, and to renew because of 2020, to allow ourselves to know and embrace the pain and the struggles of 2020, to embrace the death that is of 2020 and 2021, to embrace the brokenness, to embrace those kinds of things so that we can learn from them and change and, and make the changes that we're called to make. 
And so if people are struggling and suffering, we can do things for them. We can, someone who's struggling with COVID, we can take care of them. We can provide them with the things that they need, you know, earthly things that they need. But the call is really to embrace our capacity and, in, and enlarge our capacity for compassion. And so that's, those, that's what I'm, uh, I think the journey is that, that we're talking about is, is about that. Uh, and here's what I want to present as a kind of a fundamental, um, whoops, a, a fundamental uh, uh, template for it. So we are called into embracing what is in our life around us. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a spiritual director, I sit with people who come with issues and problems and concerns. And what I, what I, I try to do with them is to get them to understand, well, where is God in this for you? What is God calling you to in terms of your own right now, here and now experience of your relationship with Jesus? Um, what is God calling you to, to change in, in your relationship with yourself? What is God calling you to change in, in your relationship with others? What is God calling you to change in your relationship with the environment? What is God calling you to change in your relationship with the mystery of the Trinity? How is God calling you on your journey to embrace uh, Godness in all of creation and beyond, right? And so we seek, I think, in this spiritual presentation of spirituality, we seek after the lost um, because we are called to find God there. We seek after the, those who are broken because we are called to find God there. We seek after the, the, the foreigner, the homeless person, not just to make life better for them and feel good ourselves, but to find God in them and in their struggle and in their pain and to be one with them in that journey. That's what the definition of compassion is. To be one with people, to be one with in their journey, to essentially, you know, crassly put, um, walk a mile in someone else's moccasins or whatever it is, right? And so the journey is, is not about just fixing things, right? The journey is about, as Matthew would have it, experiencing in the now, the present eschatology, experiencing in the now, the presence of God, the presence of holiness, the, uh, the heavenly experience that is ours to know right now. It might not take away the homelessness. It probably won't. It might not take away the addiction. It probably won't. It might not take away the hunger or the pain or the struggle. Oftentimes it won't. But where is it that I am with this other person in that struggle? Where is God in this for us and for them and for me? One of the, I, I've preached a lot, and, and I remember one of the best compliments I ever got at Lord of the Streets is, is some lady, some little old homeless lady that came to me after the, the sermon on Sunday morning. She said, Father Bob, when you preach, I can believe that God loves me. And it's like, no, no need to say anything else. If, if God, if that's what you experience in hearing the gospel broken for you, that's exactly what the intention of the journey is, that we can be one with each other, not fixing everything, 
but being present to each other in the journey, even as Jesus was. And so, you know, so often, even uh, as we as we read the Gospels and we hear the stories of Jesus, even even doing cures, the cures were simply signs of the healing that happened underneath. So when you follow the cure, after the cure happens oftentimes, it, the next sentence is something about, and this person followed Jesus, or this person became faith-filled. This person somehow connected to the new life of the gospel, of the kingdom of God present. So that, that word that Meredith used, desire, is the most important part of the journey. And the St. Bonaventure would talk, if you want to know, if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, follow your own deepest desires, right? So don't get rid of stuff. Don't jettison stuff. Look deeply into yourself. If you believe, if I can preach that we are all made in the image and likeness of God, if I can preach that God created in six days all of this creation around me, if I can preach that God is Trinity, right? Love, this unbounded love that we talked about just a little bit ago. If, I, if that can come from my mouth and I can believe that, then I damn well have to believe that I'm good too. That doesn't mean that I can't screw up or make bad decisions, but fundamentally, that spark of, of createdness that is of God is in me. And if you want to follow Jesus, go for that. Discernment then becomes following your deepest desire. And so if it makes you feel good th that you're helping people do stuff, that's cool, you know? That's probably a, a, an affirmation. But go deeper with that. And so how, how am I with the other, right? What is it calling me to? So Bonaventure does this frame. He uses the frame of the temple uh, to kind of make concrete what I've been kind of babbling about. And, and if we look at the temple uh, on the screen, I hope everybody can see it. Uh, what time is it? Um, well, Meredith, just call time. Give me 15 minutes, will you, before it's time to quit? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so the, the court um, is that outside of the temple, that, that first, so you could walk in from the court. So if you, you know, Jesus walked in and he saw people selling all kinds of stuff and he turned over, got all angry and, and threw over the tables. And that was probably happened in the court of the temple. And then the sanctuary of the temple, of course, is the more sacred space, oftentimes was entered uh, uh, by certain folks that were uh, determined to be able to enter the sanctuary. And then the Holy of Holies was, of course, in the first temple where, where, the, where the Ark of the Covenant resided and maybe was entered once a year, depending on, you know, on all the rules, uh, which I don't have to go through right now. But essentially the temple was of three parts. And so our life, our journey is in this temple. This is where we are created to live, in this temple with each other, right? And so as we walk, as we celebrate our journey following Jesus, um, Bonaventure broke it out this way. So he determined that the, talked about the court as being the part of the temple that is outside of myself. So Bob Flick, what's outside of me? Well, all you guys are outside of me, obviously. You're created in God's own image. All of creation, you know, the sea and the sun and the, the beauty, all the stuff that Francis would trip out over, that's all, you know, in creation. That's why he's the, you know, the cats, right? The pets <laughs> that are appearing on on screen right now, uh, the kinds of things that, that are in and of creation, the things that we, those are all holy. God spent six days making that happen for us. And so we, we, we seek to find God in the court. 
So in in all of the world, in all of nature, in all of the created uh, stuff outside of us, and all, all the other people, we 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 spend time in the court seeking after finding God there. And my, maybe it's in the beauty of 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 a sunflower, and maybe it is in the experience of uh, the pain of somebody pouring hot motor oil over a sunflower. Where is God in those experiences, right? How do we find God in brokenness? How do we find God in glory? How do we find in God in all of the human experience that is outside of us, right? And so we experience these things in our body and in our senses. We take those things in. We experience creation by smelling flowers or uh, 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 being poisoned by lead in flint. We experience that in creation. And where is it that we are called to be present to those things? And how is it that we are called to, to imp as the word that we used earlier, improve them, make them better? But it's not just a matter of making things better, it's a matter of making things more consistent and congruent with how God created them to be. Forgiveness is, is, is making that relationship more congruent with how God created it to be. Cleaning up the oceans is a matter of not just fixing things, but making them more congruent with how God created them to be. Caring for people who are at the border and, and, and struggling because of, of, of fear and anxiety is, is not just a matter of giving them a place, it's a matter of making it more congruent with how God created them to be and to live, right? And so that's, that's the core, I think, of, of Matthew 25 and of the, that spiritual journey in the court, the stuff outside. So Bonaventure also says, well, the, in the spiritual journey, there's also the sanctuary and that's the stuff inside of me right? So people commit suicide because they're depressed, right? So if inside of me, I feel so deeply depressed, well, put it this way, all those feelings are part of the uh, uh, good and bad, are part of the reality of my personal experience. Um, and, and so I need to spend time there on the journey, right? So if a person is, is, is struggle, struggling with depression, it is imperative that that individual, we are called, that person, we are called to find God in those experiences, right? So I personally struggle with an anxiety disorder for which I take medication. And so I, I, I ask God, I, I spend time with the, that struggle, uh, which, which is for me a handicap that I can't, I can't get through without assistance from medication that I take every day, right? And so, when I was actively anxious and having panic disorder, um, that was painful. And so it wasn't mine to say, I need to, this isn't me, or I need to let go of this and jettison it. It was mine to say, how do I come to be as as godlike as as I can be carrying this disorder with me, how can this disorder be somehow become for me something that can aid me in in perhaps being more 
uh, able to, to work with people who struggle with mental illness, which is part of how I ended up in the business, right? Um, so do you understand? So, so it is our job to spend time with ourselves internally, with our, our memory, you know, with our understanding, with, with our cognitive knowledge, um, with, our, with the, the faculties of memory and understanding and will, which come out of the, the medieval uh, philosophy, but um, to spend time with ourselves, because there are those, and, and I am one of them to some degree, probably we all are, but I can't speak for anybody but myself, who run through life and try to jettison the things that make me, that give me pause, right? My own sinfulness, my own addiction, my own mental illness, my own uh, whatever it is that, that might be the kind of thing that I would like to rather act like isn't there. Flip side, of course, is I'm, you know, married, I have a wonderful daughter, I have, you know, I, there's all this good stuff too. I'm basically well, I haven't had COVID, all the stuff that, you know, and, and all of that is the stuff of the sanctuary. How do I feel? Um, how, how am I in relationship with the brothers and sisters in my life, my family, friends? And, and if you have broken relationships, what, that isn't something that we walk through and act like it isn't there. In the sanctuary, we spend time with that. We learn from it. We, under, we come to make decisions around it that are more godly, more in union with how it is that God created me to be in the world, okay? And then the last thing is, is then the um, seeking after on the journey, seeking after trying to find God in what is beyond the self. And this is the thing that sometimes we forget. Um, and that is just to, to be in touch with uh, as much as we can with the mysteries essentially of, a, of, of living in, in an experience of a, of a God who is, who is transcendent, um, a God who is going to be mystery, um, a God who is Trinity, a God who is defined as love, you know, what does it mean to sit uh, perhaps silently in, in the Holy of Holies, uh, contemplating literally, being one with, being present to a God who is love, a God who loves me, and a God who loves everybody equally, and a God who's, who's continuing to create and recreate in God's own image, right? This God who who forgives, what does that call me to? This God who is merciful, this God who, who is he, a healer, what does that call me to? So to, to be present to the mystery. So to, real quick, to kind of walk through this whole thing again. We are on a journey and I believe spirituality is a journey. I believe that contemplation is the tool of that journey. Contemplation being one with, one with, our cell, the, everything that's outside of us, one with everything that's inside of us, all of our junk and all of our blessing, and one with a God who is beyond us, right? Uh, in so many ways, a God who is love that we can't understand. So contemplation, being one with, being present to, being uh, connected to somehow, that we're on a journey and we find uh, and the journey, we find ourselves dealing with measuring, being present to stuff outside of us, stuff inside of us, and a God who is beyond us. And so the, de the, the desire, that, that word that Meredith used very early on, the desire is what motivates the journey. Do I have fundamentally, a deep desire to, as uh, um, Thurman said, to find the lost? Do I have a deep desire to heal the broken? Which I would think, you know, that would be me as well as others. 
um, to release the prisoner, the prisoner literally in a prison or the prisoner that is in me that might be my addiction or my uh, brokenness or in relationships, right? So the desire becomes the operative energizing uh, word in all of this. And we can lose our desire. We can be, become flat. Uh, we can, uh, the yeast can lose its, uh, the yeast can lose its, uh, its potency. And especially as we get older, you know, we just get tired. Well, I can speak for myself. I, I get tired, right? And I can very easily um, lose um, the energy of my spiritual journey. Uh, and Speaking and just of take, that, you asked me to give you your heads up. So how much time? Uh, we're flexible-ish, but you asked me to give you a heads up of fifteen minutes minutes ish. -ish. So so we have fifteen minutes, or ish. here's what I want to do. Uh, and the reason I'm asking is because I just want to open this up for discussion. Frankly, I've been babbling for a long time. It's this. good stuff. It's really good. It's really deep, Bob. It's amazing. I mean, I, for one, I mean, how many of us like, I mean, the number of times I'm like, oh yeah, 2020, like throw it away, dumpster fire it. And you're encouraging us to say like, no, like hold it and ponder it in my heart. <laughs> 2020 is our reality, our common reality. And we can't just walk through it and not milk it for all it's worth. Mm -hmm. um, what did 20, what did God call me to in my experience or us commonly in our experience of 2020 as a congregation? What has God called us to? Cause I've talked a lot about me as an individual but it, this is operative I believe as as a, as, a, as a faith community gathered as well. What does it call us to, to have an experience of a year that seems like it was from hell and nothing else could go wrong, right? <laughs> and it just keeps going wrong. Because <laughs> um, we frame it that way. Uh, when in fact, um, it's, a, it's probably clarion in, in terms of our spiritual journey. Yeah. What, what other I have to thoughts? go in a minute, but I wonder if I could say something to, to what you've been saying course, real yes. quickly. Um, first of all, thank you. My gosh, it's your insights are, are amazing. And it what you were saying made me think of um, ideas and things that I've had in my, in my mind. Um, and one of my good friends told me, um, you know, he quoted someone as saying, he saw a little boy pouring milk into a glass and realized it was all God pouring God into God. And, you know, I, I'm really good at seeing the God in other people, but not always great at seeing it in myself. And um, uh, I thought this year, as I've started living into the honesty of who I am, um, which is a deaf person, that as I was denying that part of myself, I was also denying the worth of all other deaf people. Um, and that made a real impact on me when I realized that, that if I deny pieces of myself, I deny the worth of all other people that are like me. Um, and that was what was coming to mind as you were speaking, that if, anyone else is worthy so you know if anyone else has christ in them so do i um so that was that was what came to mind as you were speaking and i um appreciate that reminder so thank you yeah and the special gift that your deafness may bring to you that that none of us can have uh, because we are hearing um and um you know to that's not to diminish the difficulties that being deaf have uh, brings or any, any other issue that people are dealing with as well. But uh, the, um, there is a special giftedness that co can come to, 
you know, through the experience that you have that no one else would have in terms of, of uh, relationships and, and so many things, yeah. Not at all to diminish the struggle that it brings to, you know, do you sign? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thank and you. actually um, that that's why I have to go. I have to get ready for, um, for deaf prayer in just a minute. So, um, but I, I want to thank you. Thank you very much for this. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being part of it. What are other people's thoughts? Um, that was a great example, you know, to, to, um, yeah, that was a great example that she, I mean, cause that's her life. Uh, and and um, to live into the fullness of how God created uh, where she finds herself right now, whether she was before, I don't know, but where she is in in life, yeah. and to and to see what God calls her to in that and through that. Yeah. What, what are other people thinking? So just reflections on like the the course of the whole discussion we've had when when you louder. when you what speak louder. Oh, I was told to speak louder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 so so when you what when early on when you asked what motivated us and and uh, and my thoughts were it's to help others to reach out to others, my thoughts immediately came to my family. There's, there's nothing I wouldn't do to help my family, but my family isn't just those that I'm related to by blood. You know, I, we're all part of God's family. So that makes me, me desire to help those in my family that sometimes I don't even know, but have a need, because you know I see everyone as part of my family. Every one of those say, faces that I see on this computer is my family, my brothers and sisters. And I think at some point in time, we have reached out and helped each other, just as we would our brothers or sisters, our mom and dad. And that's part of being God's children and finding God in each other. And, uh, and, and then uh, another thing is about who we are. And last week, I don't know if anybody remembers, but we did a song that spoke to that. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's called Glorious. And the, the, one of the verses is, you make everything glorious and I am yours. What does that make me? And that makes me glorious in spite of every one of my faults, in spite of me tripping, in spite of me getting angry, in spite of me, you know, doing things that, you know, I know I shouldn't be doing. I'm still his and I am glorious in his eyes. That's it's exactly it. And I think that's 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 exactly what is oftentimes, uh, and she alluded to it, or I forgot her name, but alluded to it earlier, that it it can we it can be so easy for us to so, sort of second guess our own love love life with God, right? That that you know we nobody knows our 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 sin the way we do, and so it's certainly easy for us to second guess that and and until we really claim god's love in our own life we're not going to be able to fully uh proclaim that to other people um that doesn't mean that i like i said that our behavior can't be horrendous sometimes but most fundamentally we are created in god's own image and god by definition is love. And so when I ask about motivation, the most fundamental motivating force 
is the discovery of Godness in in me, right? And it sounds selfish, but it's not. It's it because I'm talking about my motivation. So I seek after finding God in me, and that motivates me to find God in other people. But I have to believe in myself, right? I have to believe in in the Godness that is of me. Um, that doesn't mean I'm going to be a good preacher or teacher or um, compassionate, or I might be a real jerk, <laughs> you know. But that doesn't change my call, you know. The call is to seek after a oneness with the God who created me. The best thing that I can be to the world is to be as Bob Flick, as God created Bob Flick to be. And that's the motivation, right? That's what Jesus did. He sought to be in union with the Father, which was nothing more, nothing less. You know, he sought to be God in human flesh. And, and you know, it's not a whole lot different from what our charge is. Doesn't make me God, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Certainly of God. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I just think to find the lost for Christians, if we want to do what Jesus does, we look at his behavior. And his behavior was to... Um, to seek after those who were um, disenfranchised and those who were on the periphery and those who were, who were um, by other people told that they weren't worth a crap. That's who Jesus sought after. And that wasn't so he could fix them. It was to model to us <laughs> that that's the behavior that will will bring us into touch with ourselves and with the God who is inside of us and in union and to union with each other. What causes building, you know, what causes us to lose that is when we hold it against others. We judge others. We put them in boxes. We, and then we can, you know, more easily discard the box, um, you know, aliens or what you know whatever we call each other that somehow frees us to to discard than a human being uh, created in God's own image anyway perhaps I've exhausted my <laughs> what I can do here yeah. tonight because I just bam one <laughs> it's wonderful and so any anyone else want to jump in any uh, any final thoughts any way it's like hitting you what are you taking away what are you taking home not that you're not home. Let me rephrase that. What are you taking to bed with you? What are you chewing <laughs> yeah. on tonight? Late well, at night? That we're enough. Yes. That's always, you're always not. You are good enough. You are enough. Mm -hmm. and that's what I'm taking home. I think it's been a, it's been a challenge for me this year because when we feel like we're following God's call, we're out doing things for people and that's just come to a stop and it's been learning to be okay with myself having contemplative time uh it's just a, been a whole different way of life but it's been probably what i needed <laughs> yeah yeah and how many how much has god said to us this year about spending time you know, uh, in quiet or spending time with family or, or not putting our uh, self-worth or identification into all the things that we can accomplish or buy or enjoy, you know, uh, whatever that means, you know. I think we, I think there's a whole lot to learn about the intervention uh, of, of 2020 <laughs> in, in my life. Yeah. exactly and and that boils down to being more contemplative being present 
to that experience or set of experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I found it with the uh, pandemic, it's sort of through a monkey wrench to our routines. And like Carol and others said, it did provide time for us just to be with ourselves and, and to uh, have, you know, you know, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Yeah. I relate to what you're saying. I, you know, uh, I embrace Richard Rohr and the Franciscan. Uh, Richard and I were yeah. classmates. He was a, he was a couple of classes ahead of me in seminary. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, for me, what I've struggled with this year and been praying about is my action. And then I look at the action that I participated in and engaged in this year was I increased letter writing. I'm involved in Cairo, so I increased letter writing to a lot of the uh, brothers that are incarcerated, mm -hmm. and then telephone uh, that, uh, you know, uh, through our church, you know, Ron, we had a telephone tree, and, you know, as a lay Eucharistic visitor, I kept my last live report, and I touched base, and what was amazing was, uh, you know, I learned more about my brothers and sisters, you know, and, and that thing. And I found blessing. I found that also, too, that uh, praying, saying a prayer, you know, it's like once develop into, yes, I've been waiting. I want my prayer, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and it, but, it, but it's a connection. And it, and it does with the love. And that was all of us because, you know, I, I, I prayed, you know, Lord Chester's prayer every day to know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. And uh, so that's, uh, I would say, my struggle has been the action, and yet there has been action, touching base with my family members and uh, with that. But it's been, you know, it's been via that. And also realizing that, yes, God is love and he calls us to be love. And we're needed. You know, it's, it, we're needed because of the division. You know, the, one of the prayers I look at, okay, how can I be, how can God use me? Not what I could do for God, but how can God use me for his purposes? You know, to be a peacemaker with, uh, you know, with a, a where we're not listening to one another, we're we're stuck in our uh, belief systems and our ideologies, and that we're right and everyone else is wrong. You know? Those are the things that we use, we can use so easily to divide us. Um, so when you say, "How can God use you to be?" You know. God, he wants God to will use you if you if you are as John as you can can be. If you are as genuinely John as you have created been created to be. That's the best gift that you have to give to all of us. Well, anyway, that's, that's, our, my, that's our journey, conversion journey. It is a journey. Bob, will you offer us a prayer? Sure, I'd happy to. Um, Thank you all. Um, this was fun. Uh, sometimes I feel like I talk too much, but no. I don't know about you all. Like I've I have things to chew on. How many of y'all have got some stuff to chew on? Yeah, chew yeah. on. Something. How many? How many folks yes. are like wait? And I just did. I mean, I I've done three day retreats, but the material that I you know kind of spend a day in the in the temple and a day. I mean, a, a day in the sanctuary and whatever. So I don't know. Let's pray. Um, Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise for your presence among us. Uh, we continue to open our hearts and our, our minds, uh, desiring to be 
one with you and learning how to be one with each other and with the world around us, one with myself. Um, we thank you and praise you for blessing us with this time together. We trust in your spirit present as we continue our journey, knowing, Lord, that you will never abandon us and that through your son, Jesus, and at our table, our common table, you feed us on that journey. We bless you and praise you for the Meredith and for Nikki and for the leadership at Trinity and the community that is called to faith around their common table. We trust that they will continue, Lord, to be fed by your word and by your spirit in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. So Thank you. Gonna, we're going to have to have you back sometime, Bob, like, because like 45 minute whirlwind was not enough. So thank you so much yeah. for okay. joining us. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Have a good thank one. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And uh, bye bye. those who will be with us next week, uh, we're healing the broken with Nikki. All right. Good night, y'all. All right. Nikki. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye bye.